Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, Adult Education Advocacy in Action, a strategic and powerful approach to making legislative change happen. Today, our webinar is generously sponsored by Essential Education, and we have Dan Griffin with us today. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. Hopefully, you guys can see my screen. Um, we love our relationship with COABE and thanks to all of you for a great conference last week. We had so much fun out in Seattle. I hope all of you are signed up for Atlanta next year. It's gonna be great to see everybody. I'm sure we'll have even more uh, people on site. Uh, I started thinking about what can essential education do to help in terms of advocacy? And, um, you know, and, and I mean, I've been a salesman for a long time. So when you're meeting with somebody uh, to advocate for, uh, investment and funding in adult education, you're basically selling the concept of adult education to someone. And you may want to show some of the innovations and some of the things that are going on in adult education that are you know, powerfully impacting adults all over the country. And I think we play a role in that to some extent for, for a few things uh, that we've done recently that you would be welcome to show somebody quickly. You could do it in a couple of minutes and it would make your point that there are powerful things happening in adult education to move adults quickly through a pathway and into employment and into really fulfilling careers and, and lives. Uh, our programs are adaptive. That might be important to somebody to be able to show that uh, everything is individualized for someone so that they're on the fastest path through. We just launched uh, a new correlation or connection automation it is with Credly where they earn badges in our program and those badges automatically appear in Credly which is the largest badging uh, service uh, in the world. And, um, and so a student could send an employer there to see the badges they've earned in workplace soft skills or other uh, skills that would be important to them. And that's really cutting edge and innovative and something that would make a cool case to show somebody about how we're trying to connect employers and students in a technology rich environment. All of our content's mobile friendly. You could pull out a cell phone and show somebody how students can access content anytime, anywhere. Um, we're 508 compliant. So if disability, ADA, 
Uh, compliance is important. There's all features in our program that show that we're meeting the needs of all learners, regardless of um, learning needs. And then we have this uh, new Spanish uh, content scaffolding that we've built in that shows how we're helping people transition from uh, Spanish into English so that they can move forward in their post-secondary and career uh, aspirations. So if any of those are interesting to you and something that you'd like a little advice on, like how do I show this quickly in a couple of minutes, uh, click that QR code or email me at dan at essentialed.com. I'd be glad to jump on with you at any time or give you some talking points or help you figure out, you know, how do I make two minutes really sing when I'm sitting with somebody to show them the innovations that are going on in adult education. We love being able to sponsor COAB and work with them. We sponsor all kinds of groups and uh, programs and uh, Educate and Elevate is one that we're really interested in. So thank you all so much for all you do in adult ed. I will uh, turn it over now to Jeff and I think he's gonna take you through a whole bunch of things. So thank you, Dan, and hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm so excited. Uh, let me just get my share screen up so we can get rocking and rolling here. Um, there we go. So good afternoon, everybody, for Adult Education in Action. We're going to be talking advocacy today and how appropriate because it is April Advocacy Month. And we're really excited about all the work that everyone's doing. So I want to start off before we jump in. I want you to, if you can, put in the chat box um, where you're an advocate from, because you're all advocates today. And then I want you to also put in there where, uh, where in your city or state is the best pizza? Where do you get the very best pizza in your city or state? So take a second and do that. Put that in the chat box and I'll explain in a second. Phoenix, okay, from Tucson. Hi, Sarah, welcome. We got some of our safe fellows on today. Excited about that from Maine. Kind of Sal's, okay, from Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, everybody's throwing in their favorite pizza place. I love it. Good deal. So thank you and welcome everybody. We have a great group today. I know many of you that are on the on the webinar. Awesome. So we're gonna jump in. You can keep doing that if you like. But today we're talking about strategic and powerful approaches to making legislative change and how we make it happen. And give you a, a quick overview of what's going to happen today. We're going to be diving right in and we're going to start with talking about advocacy and what it really is to be an advocate, what it means, and how storytelling really is um, an integral part of that. We'll go into a touch a little bit about advocacy and lobbying because it is a concern for some people as they jump into the swimming pool. Um, where do you start? And that I think is the frustration with a lot of people that are doing adult literacy and adult education, like where do you begin your advocacy work and how does it start? We'll talk through all of that and how you build a campaign and then really get into what the pitch is like. Like how do you make that pitch? And then um, advocacy and action, like what does it mean to, to really put it into, into action and how can we do it as teachers, instructors, administrators, and, and really start diving into that part of it. So that's kind of the agenda for today. Um, I do a, a lot of talks and when one of the, my favorite ones is what we're about to hear today is really talking about advocacy. Really, I guess the notion of what is advocacy and it really is by definition to change what is into what should be and from your perspective. And really the definition is pretty simple, but when we talk about advocacy, we really need to think about are are we advocates? Like, what makes somebody an advocate? And and where you know, is it just a definition, or does it mean you really are up on Capitol Hill? Is that where it, advocacy happens, or does it happen in your state legislature? Or you know, can you advocate in a pizza place, or can you advocate anywhere you go? And I threw that first challenge out for you today um, about putting in your favorite pizza place because quite often when you're an advocate, you're talking about things that are from your perspective, right? There are things that come from your glasses and the glasses that you wear, your experiences, and trying to get people to understand that perspective 
and, and sometimes even go to that pizza place or buy that slice of pizza so they can experience it as well. And they can see the benefit of actually, you know, going to that, um, the place that you're suggesting. Uh, my name is Jeff Abramowitz. I'm an executive director at Jeff's Human Services. I oversee our justice partnerships. And I'm also really proud to be secretary of the board of the Coalition on Adult Basic Education. Uh, for those that were at the conference recently, um, welcome and hello. I hope we got to connect while you were there. For those that watched virtually or participated virtually, um, it's um, I'm great to catch up with you again. And for those that haven't, you may wanna check it out on the website and see if you can jump in on some of the wonderful sessions that happened during the, the COAP conference, which was really wonderful in Seattle. So, I wanted to start with advocacy because I was thinking personally of why, when my advocacy started. So a little bit about me, I guess I, I was trying to think back the first time that I became an advocate. And I think it was when I was a child. Um, I was, I think, 10 or 12 years old. And I really wanted to, I love baseball and wanted to play baseball in a league. And I went in to see my dad and my dad said, you can't play in that league because it's not in our township. And, you know, I, I said, dad, but our uncle lives in the township and he could put me in and put my name down and it's his son or his relative and we can get in that way. And um, I sure enough, I pushed hard enough and long enough, made all these arguments. And I said, there are great teams over there and I want to play on the best team and kept going and going at it. And sure enough, my dad said, OK, OK, we'll call your uncle. And, and he registered me and I got to play in that league. And I think that was the first time that I, I can think back in my life where I really was an advocate. Like I really stood up for something I believed in and pushed hard enough to make it happen, to make it real. And as I grew up, I always wanted to be a lawyer and um, became a trial lawyer in Philadelphia. And in my practice as a trial lawyer, boy, you want to talk about advocacy. I mean, it was 24-7 for me. Every single day I was in the courtroom, I was advocating. I was advocating for my clients. I was advocating in front of a judge. I was trying to convince a jury. I was constantly advocating. I was trying to think of ways that I could lay out an issue so that I could be persuasive, uh, but most importantly, how I could tell the story. Um, for those of you that don't know my story, um, I was a lawyer for 20 years, a trial lawyer in Philadelphia, uh, made some poor choices that landed me in a federal prison for five years. And even in, in my journey through the criminal justice system, I became an advocate. I was advocating for men and women that were incarcerated. I was advocating for people that I lived with. I was advocating for the students that were in my classroom as I taught over 60 classes behind the walls. And then I continued on the outside. Um, I first began um, my journey coming home teaching GED math and advocating for my students and working for them and teaching them and, and trying to be the voice of getting more support services for them and more books and better tools and digital more digital support. Um, so advocacy continued to grow and then it really blossomed um, in, in a significant way as I came to Jeb's and began doing more and more work with COABE and took seats in workforce development and also with the US Department of Education and working with them and moderating their their links platform for correctional and reentry education and doing all these great things. But the bottom line is every single thing that I do, I'm an advocate. I'm trying to um, get um, people in society to understand the challenges of people in the justice system. But more importantly, I'm trying to get them to recognize the importance of adult education and literacy throughout our country and the blend of adult education into workforce development and how important it is to get people smarter so that they can become successful in the career pathways that, that they desire. So that's my advocacy role. And we all are advocates. Everyone on this call is an advocate in some form or fashion. But the truth is advocacy is something that starts with the art of storytelling. I remember as a lawyer going into courtroom and jury trial after jury trial, working with people and trying to get that jury to understand my client's position. I always called it trying to get them to sing my song, right? If I left and the jury was singing my song, then you knew you were going to be successful. And as I think about this, what's one of the most famous things that's happened in our courtrooms in America, where the jury and the public actually sang the song of the lawyers. Um, if you remember the OJ Simpson case, where the jury, um, the big scene where he says, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit, right? Um, the jury left that courtroom singing their song. 
he was singing the song of the what the what the defense attorneys were trying to get across and boy how effective that was that visual played over and over and over again and today it sticks out in my mind as one of the most effective tools of storytelling because he told a story and it, re it remained with people and that picture. So the art of storytelling is crucial in, in the work that we do as advocates and being an advocate. So what does it mean and how do you tell a story and how do you do it effectively? Um, it's not, it really isn't a rocket science kind of thing. It's storytelling is, you know, it seriously is one of the most, the oldest and most powerful tools that we have in our society, but there are really some basic things that you should be looking at. One is keeping it simple, you know, that keep it simple, stupid kiss. Um, that's how I remember it. Keep it simple. Use simple language. Um, sometimes when you use complicated language, and as educators, we do this all the time. We do this all the time. And I'm guilty of it myself. I catch myself. I go in to talk to a legislator and I say, well, under WIOA. And I'm like, uh, yeah, they're not going to know what WIOA is, right? And or the, the NRS. Uh, or, you know, we talk about all these different things and we use, we use letters and we need to use words. We need to use simple language. The federal law says this, and that gu guides educators to meet certain standards. So keep the language really simple and basic. We need to use empathy. Um, we need to, the force of empathy cannot, um, you know, is so impactful. And, and really when we just, we were trying to persuade someone um, to come over to our side, you know, we're, even if it's describing pizza, we might describe it as, you know, um, it's, it's, you know, cheesy and saucy and garlicky, whatever, but you're going to use words, but you want to paint that picture. And part of that is getting them to feel it from the inside, getting them to understand it um, from their heart, from their soul. And that leads to an effective story. But no story is really effective unless you can back it up with data, unless you can support it with facts that you're trying to um, that you're trying to to build your case around. So back up your story with data, and we're going to talk a lot about data today and it, the in, the importance of data in advocacy for education and how and workforce development. Um, when we talk to about data, we also need to include that call to action. And I remember um, a quick story. There was a, a young lady who um, had this remarkable story about her father. Her father was, um, he was literally could not read at all. He had no reading, no, could not read a single word and for, for multiple reasons. But he often went into a restaurant and he, and when he would order, he looked at the menu, but he almost always said, I'll have what he, she had, or I'll have what he had, or he'll point to this, the thing on the menu, not even knowing what it was. And that was what, how he ordered. And she had this remarkable story. And she told this story to a, a very large, to an executive at a company. He said, look, I want to hire you, but you need to go through the process. So he had her go, and it was for a major adult literacy company that, that was doing work. And he went on, she went on the interview and she, she, she went through the interview process and she came out of the interview and he said, how'd it go? And he said, she thought it went pretty well. Um, he said, did you tell your story? Like, did they recognize it? And did they, did they touch, connect with you? And she said, I never told the story. It just, it, I just never told it. I just, you know, got involved in other questions. And he said, get back in there, get back in there and tell them the story, because that's why you got involved in adult education. That's why you got involved in, you know, making people, uh, you know, getting people smarter and, and, and the ability to read. And she didn't tell the story. So she went back in. She said, I'm sorry. You know, I really need to be clear on why I'm even here. And she told the story about her dad and her dad not being able to, to read or write and how she worked with him after college and uh, after high school and college to help him kind of navigate that and getting him his GED and, and how he progressed. And uh, she did, in fact, get the job, but she got the job because of the impact of the story and the impact of telling the story about her dad not being able to order off a simple menu. Um, one of the things that we need to build in to a lot of besides the empathy and the data and the facts is, you know, remembering that we're there for a purpose and the people that we're talking to may not even know what that purpose is, but part of that is understanding that call to action. So I always say, and we'll talk about this in a little bit too, is that you need to tell them what you're going to tell them and you need to tell them why you're there, what you're asking for.
and be really clear about it. We want $810 million in adult education funding um, in the next appropriation bill. Be really clear. This, that's why we're here. That's what we're going to talk about. Or maybe it's something different. We want digital literacy in our prisons and jails, or we want whatever it is, lay it out there. Be, put that call to action right up front. Um, and then you want to also know who you're talking to, right? You want to tailor your story to the audience, because quite frankly, not every audience is going to be um, is is going to be receptive to the story you're going to tell, and you're going to need to understand how to um, how to tweak your story based on your audience. Um, you're going to tell a different st story to a senator or uh, a legislator than you would possibly somebody that sits on a commission uh, or somebody that sits on an administrative board. So you really want to be careful to tweak your story and make sure you tailor it to the audience that you're in front of. And it also means talking, you may be talking to students or you may be talking to, um, to adults or, or a different population. But whatever it is, make sure that your story is matches up the audience that you're going to be you're going to be talking to. Um, I truly believe and I have, I'm going to say this a few times today, but I think a, a picture paints a thousand words and you need to you need to paint the picture and sometimes having a live picture have, having somebody really there is so impactful when they tell their story. Um, the gentleman that's in this picture is a gentleman who has um, served our country as a veteran, came back to the United States after serving and um, got addicted to drugs, had some real challenges in that, that area and uh, decided he wanted to turn his life around eventually, he came and worked with him. And we got him into a position where he could start, he started in a construction field and, and worked his way all the way up to a site management supervisor on a major construction demolition site. And, and the picture of him um, always just impresses me. It just sticks in me that uh, not only the work that we do, but the story that he told and him ch his challenges that he faced coming home and supporting his, his addiction. So kind of think about how you're gonna tell the story, but using pictures, using things that people can relate to uh, are often one of the best ways of being an effective storyteller. You know, we tell stories for a lot of different reasons, but the reason that they matter quite often is because there are stories. There are stories. There's the stories of self. You know, I often when I talk about my background and my past, people may not remember a lot about me, but they know that he was um, that he was a, a there was this guy. He was he was a lawyer. He was a white lawyer for 20 years and went to prison, spent five years away. They may not remember a lot about the content of what they I tell them, but they do remember that it was a story of me. It's a story of myself and something that I share. Um, the story of us also needs to have some, some shared values. So the one thing about adult education and adult literacy and workforce development is no matter which aisle you sit in, where you are on the political spectrum is irrelevant because no question without any doubt that the is consensus everyone in the in the country can agree we want to get people smarter everyone in the country can agree that we want to get people into successful career pathways and into jobs right so that we can we can be self sufficient so those are the things that go across both sides, both aisles and they're they're not they're not political that everyone can agree. Now, how you get there or how much and those kinds of things, that gets a little tricky to navigate. We'll talk through that some a little bit more today. But the bottom line is when we talk about adult education and career pathways and jobs and workforce development, you're going to get the ear. You're going to get your foot in the door. You're going to get people talking about it at the local level, to the mayor's level, to the state level, on the governor's level, all the way up into um, to, to the White House. I mean, these are issues that are, are common ground for everyone and just understanding the strategy of how to do it and how to do it effectively is gonna be super, super key. And then also the strategy. What strategy, what are we asking for? And the urgency of it. You know, oftentimes things get stuck in our, in our legislature for years and years and buried and sometimes never come back up. Um, the urgency of adult education um, is, is extremely important to point out that these things can't wait. They can't wait a year or two or three or five years because these are individuals who are struggling now that need our help and need our assistance. 
And we have an economy that needs our help right now. And we can't wait six years or seven years for a piece of legislation that's going to put computers into more classrooms and to get um, you know, more career and technical education training and apprenticeships off the ground. We need this stuff now and it has to happen. And that urgency really needs to be one of the key messaging points that you should be pointing out at every meeting that you have and with every discussion that you have. When we talk about pictures, again, there's another picture I'll talk about in a second, but the most important things about the storytelling are really thinking about three targets. One is that transportation of the audience so that they're absorbed in the story. So you're really engaging them. You know, when I tell stories and I tell about myself, or I tell about the people I work with, um, I want to see the look on their faces that just is like, yeah, I get it. I get it. It's one of the challenges doing these things because I really can't see everybody's face as to what they're thinking or, or you know, their reactions. But you want to transport the audience so that they're absorbed in the story. Um, I often just define it as keeping them or helping them stay awake, right? Um, it's more than that, though. It's more than them just staying awake. It's actually getting them absorbed in the story so that they're asking questions and they want to know more. And part of that is also this relatability. I mean, if you're talking about something that is really high tech, you know, super technical, um, you need to bring it down to a level where somebody can relate to it. And, you know, I remember um, when I when I came home, I, I taught behind the walls um, GED class, but I was at my first interview was for a GED math position, which I ended up getting that they were asking me all these questions. And I didn't know the answer. And I was really brutally honest. I was like, look, I can't tell you all the philosophies behind a tape test, right? And, and I, I, I actually had Google tape test before I, I even took the interview. So I knew exactly what that meant. But the point was that, you know, they need to know that you're real about it and that you can relate to it as well. Um, and it's okay if you don't know everything about it, but they need to be able to see themselves in the story. They need to understand that there's, uh, there's this connection between the audience and the story you're trying to get. And then there's an emotional piece. Like, are you really coming from the heart? Is this, and you can see it. We all can see it. It's like our students telling us something and we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know we're playing the small violin for them, right? Because we know they're not really sincere about it. Um, empathy is something that we often can tell by the way somebody's reacting, the way you're seeing them. And I often, I call it the tear moment. It's when, you know, you see the tears, you know, you see somebody that's tears. If anybody was at the COIB conference, um, Anna Chavarin um, got to speak, one of the students, and she was a single mom and told her story. And, and there wasn't a dry eye in the entire session um, that listened to her because quite frankly, um, she told her story really effectively. And her story as an adult learner um, touched all those that were in the room and that were watching virtually because we could see ourselves not only working with students that had those same challenges, but we empathized with it. We felt it. We were transported by it. And, you know, those are the models you want to look at. You know, when you tell a story are the ones that and often if you look at um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of great YouTube videos, um, but TEDx talks do it really well. There's some really great TEDx talks that can show you a, a, um, really how somebody transports you into their world and tells you about, you know, all the things that um, you're now feeling um, through the words that, that they're bringing up and, and sometimes the photographs. So those are some of the key things you want to take a, a look at as you as you draw your picture or paint your picture for legislators and going through them. So we're um, storytelling is the first part, but I I recognize that um, is it advocacy or lobbying often is one of the biggest stumbling blocks for agile, adult educators and people doing workforce development is you know what is it <laughs> can I do it you know in the state in in the world of um, the work that we do in one of the big questions I get is can I do this. Can I do this? And, you know, we've talked recently, we talked to our um, SAFE fellows um, in the co program, and, and we wanted them to understand the difference between lobbying and advocacy, because it is different. There is some difference, and they're kind of technical. But the basic thing is that when you're lobbying, that there's money, you're doing it for a fee for something, you're, you're being paid to do it, or you're getting compensated in some form or fashion 
for the work that you're doing. Um, when you're an advocate, you can advocate for just about anything. Um, when you advocate for policy, that's where the difference and the, the sort of the, the line is and that you have to be aware of. But when you advocate for policy, you should be clear that you're advocating for something that you believe in. Um, you want to be you want to be really straightforward that, you know, you may be um, rep, you may be um, on a board for a state association. You may be representing a Title II agency. But when you're advocating, you're advocating based upon your experiences and you're pushing a, a perspective on a piece of legislation um, and you're representing yourself. And, and that's really important because a lot of organizations, including COABE and others, other organizations are guided by different principles. If you're a nonprofit, there are certain regulations. If you're a state agency, there are certain regulations. So I think the safest thing when you talk about advocacy is to say, this is, I believe strongly in this position. And I believe that we need digital literacy for everyone and make sure that these are positions that you're taking up. Now, as an organization, you can advocate as well. Um, but when we're talking about individual advocacy, you're not accepting money for, from any organization to do it and you're not getting paid for it. And that's really the important, the important difference when we talk about lobbying uh, because they are getting paid for it. One of the the challenges I, I think most people have when we talk about advocacy is, gosh, where do I start? You know, where do I start? And I always tell people the very first thing you start with is your purpose. You, you got to start with your purpose. What are we trying? To, what, what is it that bothers me? What is it that I feel really needs to be changed? What is it that I want to move forward? And how do I want to do it? But you need to start with that purpose. And sometimes we go in and, you know, we want to solve world hunger. Well, well, it's a great purpose, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of lanes to that and how you go about doing it could be really challenging. I think when you when we talk about advocacy, it's really being focused on what your agenda is. And sometimes that agenda can be rather large. And I would say that to be an effective advocate is really honing it into one or two or three items that you feel are the most, um, the top of your list, that bucket list of things that you want to push forward for and you want to get that message across on. Because oftentimes, if you lay out 15 or 20 items, guess what? they're probably going to get all diffused and confused and, and, and probably not going to get a lot of room on that. But if you go in talking about one or two items or maybe three items that you really want to target and you want to raise awareness on, then that's, uh, that is the, the, the prime thing you want to try to, uh, to start with. So start with your purpose. Look at that purpose. And then, and then after that, so I'm going to tell you another quick story. There was a gentleman that came to me um, after I came home. I had started a company and, and he said, Mr. A, I, I really like the work you're doing. And here's a check. You fill it out for what you like, but I want to be part of your team and I want to invest in this. And I was like, OK, just he's going to be a partner. I'm like, OK, well, just answer me one question. Like, what's, um, what's important to you? And he said, well, two things. One is I got I have kids in college right now and I need to know that they're provided for. So money is important to me that you know I have a house and I get a regular income. And he said, second is you know, I'm getting at this age where I need to have purpose in my life. Like I need to know that, you know, it's uh, that's purpose, that, that everything I do has meaning. You know, I'm just at a point where I've been successful in my other careers. I want to have that purpose. And um, I passed the check back to them. It was a simple decision for me because one reason, I thought he got them backwards. If you, if you put purpose first and the money's going to come, if you start with your purpose and why you're there and you really hit hard on what the purpose is, then the money's going to come from it. And that's the same thing in the work we do as adult educators and administrators. If you're running a good program and you're doing good work and you can continue to do good work, you can support the work you do, that money is going to come to you. It will. Um, trust me, because those are the things that people look to. You can't have a solid program. You can't have that purpose and think that money is going to flow if the purpose isn't there and the reason for it. So the essential elements of, the, of any campaign, an advocacy campaign, starts with that, finding that purpose and then raising awareness of what the problem is. 
What's the problem? What is the issues that we're dealing with? And we know in adult education, there are so many of them, but it comes down to really essentially that we need more resources, right? We need more resources. Often we need more pay. We need to, we need to be able to do a better job educating our students and remove some of those barriers that surround them. And so raising awareness of what is the problem that you're honing in on and really identifying it. We don't have enough computers. We don't have enough books. We don't have enough access to digital literacy. We don't have enough um, resources. And we don't have enough staff time. We don't have enough time to prepare. Understand what the problem is that you're addressing. And, and then the possibility starts to blossom because then you need to also with that, follow up with, well, here's what the solution is. We have the problem and we know that if we had more computers that we'd be able to serve more people, we'd be able to do X, Y, and Z. And then we'd be able to start, you're setting up the solution, what's next. And then after that is gonna be, we need to motivate them, the policymakers to act. We need to get them to acknowledge that, okay, I got the problem, I understand that, I get the solution. I, I know. I think I know where you're going with that. And now I need, why should I act now? Why is this so important today for me to act? And what's going to motivate me to act? Well, you have constituent, constituents in your neighborhoods that are having these, facing these issues and unemployment in your neighborhoods and all those things that are happening. So you want to really be able to create the purpose for them or the motivation for the policymaker to act. And these are the different buckets. Um, you know, so raising awareness really takes coalition building. It takes getting all the parties to the table. And I get frustrated sometimes when I talk to adult educators because they think their world is about, you know, our world is about, you know, our teachers and getting our teachers in there. But it's really a lot more than that. Our, our coalition should be our teachers, but our, our administrators. It should also be our students should be prime right there. How about all of our vendors? You know, people that are building, we heard Essential Ed was on today, but how about bring the vendors to the table? So these are the products that we need in our classrooms, right? Um, and then when we, it's that whole, the community, um, all the community and how community benefits um, from adult education, adult literacy. And then taking it a step further is bring on those employers. For those of you that haven't listened, you need to check out our podcast with Behind Every Employer um, with Anson Green. Anson and I do um, this wonderful uh, this this wonderful podcast, and it's bringing them all to the table. So here's the here's what really happens. I'm going to lay this out, and I'm going off a little bit, but that's okay. This is what happens. You walk into a legislative letter, legislative office and you have a student with you and you give this whole great pitch about how much you need more funding, right, for X, Y, and Z. And what you don't see is this. You walk out the door, you've done your pitch, done a great job and everything else. The next person that walks in that door is one of these huge companies that's bringing millions of dollars to uh, millions and millions of dollars to your to that, that, to that legislative district. Right. Um, so you're competing against you're you're competing against all these other um, you're competing against all these other entities that are out there that could be really, really powerful and impactful. So you have to remember that the more people you could bring into your coalition and that coalition building, the more effective you're going to be and the more you're going to be able to not so worry about you know, that Amazon, because guess what? I just brought Tyson Foods with me, right? I just brought Amazon. I just brought Google in with me. And there's Google sitting next to me telling, telling the legislator about the great work Google's doing with adult education. You want to build that coalition so they're going to remember those big parties. Because quite frankly, you know, adult education in our country, we don't have billions of dollars to spend on advocacy work. And we are the grassroots. We're the people that need to bring the coalition to the table, all those stakeholders to make it happen. Um, social media, unbelievably effective um, when we talk about raising awareness of adult literacy issues. You know, you should have a policy in your agency, no matter who you are. When you have a graduation, you're inviting legislators there, local, state, federal, invite them all. When you have a graduation, when you have a ceremony, when you have somebody graduate that's got a great story, put an op-ed out, get a press release out. You want to get them on social media. 
You want the world to know the work you're doing. And for years and years, we've just not done a great job at it. We got to get out there and we need to share those stories. Those are the stories that are impactful. And sometimes it means even having a local event, um, an open house at your Title II agency or your adult literacy agency or at your college, um, having a tour, going around. I recently hosted the state of Iowa had some educators came to Philadelphia and we spent three days with them, hosting them around. And I took them to Orleans Technical College that my agency at Jeb's Human Services owns and operates. And we took them to all these great places so that they could see it, they could smell it. And they came back with stories and they're talking about the work that's being done in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, um, taking people on tours and showing them around. And then uh, legislators love awards. Just go and throw an award in there and give them an award. Um, and then building up your toolkits. You know, we, we really feel at COAID that we have some great tools that are available for you, but having your own advocacy toolkit where you can just have handy right with a push of a button, knowing all your data and facts and where to get them and have these things ready to go are all things that will help you raise the awareness of adult education, adult literacy in uh, not only your organization, but your community and nationally. Understanding the solutions are really challenging because sometimes it's beyond us. It's often beyond me. Um, I do a lot of work in Washington and, and read bills sometimes three, four, or five times before I understand what they're even talking about. But understanding your federal funding or state funding, and if you're not sure, reach out to COABE and say, you know, I'm not sure about our funding stream, or your state association would be even better, and say, look, I'm not sure, you know, what's happening here, and how do we get funded, and where does the money go to, and why didn't we get CARES Act funding, right? I mean, that's a big question for me. Like, why didn't we get CARES Act funding that came down for adult education? Some states did, but some states didn't, and, and understanding what those issues are. So those lead to the solutions. Um, the recovery fund opportunities, using data effectively and having data at your hands help build that solution. We know that we had 20,000 adult educators were touched by this particular issue and how we build it out. Um, somebody did ask about the podcast, and I just want to repeat, it was Behind Every Employer with Anson Green, and it is posted on the COABE website. Um, so also talk about the impact. You know, we're good at coming up with the solutions, but you know, honestly, it's what does it change? And I love the reality that we can, and we have the data now um, that we're doing a return on investment study at CoAbe to really show what's the impact of somebody getting a GED or high school equivalency. What does that mean in numbers and dollars and cents? And boy, can that be impactful? You know, when you think about the numbers and you look at how much money flows down by getting somebody back to work and in a career pathway uh, and taking them off of, um, you know, sometimes the welfare rolls, uh, those are things that if you could show those impact numbers, wow, that's something that's persuasive. And then also this feasibility and, and understanding that, you know, we, you know, we can't, we're not going to get everything in this world. Um, but I, I do believe when it comes to adult education, just like in the justice space, that you do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And that means you have to chip away. You have to continue to pound on getting these victories one after the other, however big or however small. And, and there needs, it needs to be realistic. We need to understand that we're not going to get certain things through Congress or through our state houses or our legis state legislatures or even our, our local legislative offices sometimes because of a political climate. So that's, I'm going on a soapbox now, but I'm gonna tell you quite frankly, it's one of the things that upsets me most of where our country is right now. And it's not that we disagree because I think disagreement under our constitution and in our country is healthy. We need to disagree, but we need to be able to listen. We need to listen to both sides so that at least we can understand where the other side is coming from. And if we can understand where the other side is coming from, then maybe we get just a, just a tad bit closer, just a tad bit closer to finding a compromise, a place that we can find um, we could commonality. And, and that's where solutions happen. That's where change happens. Um, advocacy and, and lobbying, this oftentimes involves politics and involves playing the game. 
And it is, in fact, a chess game sometimes. It's understanding who's the key legislators you're going to. You know, if you're spending time with a legislator that has no impact on a certain issue, um, not that you shouldn't have the discussion with him, because I think everyone needs to be educated on many of the issues we deal with, but understand the impact from that person. Um, obviously, people that are on um, appropriations committees might have a lot more impact and be able to help you understand what you need to do in order to get some legislation through and make those meetings effective. Um, and you can play politics in many different ways, just offering to give testimony on an issue or sharing your knowledge. You know, instructors and teachers and administrators, you are the experts. You are the ones out there giving the, you know, you're the ones out there that they're gonna rely on to really give um, the, the final say. And, um, and to share your expertise. Um, the plan is simple, raising awareness. And I'll, again, I'll share all these slides with you and developing the solution and motivating people are all key. But the central pieces are really gathering the intelligence, getting investing in the relationships with individuals. And I want a quick point on this is just because you're not meeting with someone with a key legislator does, and you're meeting with their aide, Trust me, those aides can be as impactful, if not more impactful than the actual legislators sometimes. So build those relationships because they're the ones gonna be reaching out to you and saying, you know what? I just got a question from the Senator or from the mayor or from the governor and they wanna know about this issue. And, um, and you're the one they're gonna go to because you got the relationship. Um, be prepared. No matter what you do, prepare for that meeting and then run the meeting effectively. And I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on that. Um, but gathering intelligence is all kind of pretty, pretty common sense. You want to gather who they are. You know, what have they voted for in the past? What's the information and, and the bills that they've supported that might be similar or their ideological background? And how does that support the work they do? Um, and also maybe some tidbits of, you know, relatives and the works that are, you know, people that, that they're surrounded by. So always do your homework on the legislator himself, as well as their team, just to find out, you know, what are they really, where are their target? What's their platform? One easy tip for you, every, every legislator, I don't, I have just about everyone from city council members across the country to state legislature, they all put out these great newsletters Get on them, get on every newsletter you can so you can see exactly what their targets are. You know, what are they going and looking at? And what are the things, the objectives that they're trying to push forward in their jurisdictions and their districts? Um, just a great way to stay on tap. Investing in relationships are just little things that you can do. Um, I make a policy of whenever I see a legislator's birthday of sending them a personal birthday note. Um, it's just a little thing, and I know it's hokey, but you know what? Those little things are remembered by legislators. I was at an event this um, past week. Somebody came up to me and said, Mr. A, you were here when we had three people in the audience when we were just starting. Yeah, um, they remember. So um, create those relationships and really invest in them and not in money. And you don't have to wine and dine people. Um, just send them something. Send them a picture of a graduation class. Um, send them your newsletter, you know, invite them for a coffee. Um, little things often can have the biggest impact when you invest in relationships. Um, and those are the things kind of often that, that are most impactful. Um, key partners at the table. And again, I, I want to just point out a few of these, but, you know, you are the educators, you have the expertise, but there are others at the table which are really, um, could be really helpful for you. So some people that should be at the table are your state associations. Um, we're really, there are some unbelievably strong state associations in our country that can provide tremendous resources and support and often have a relationship with key legislators. So reach out to your state legislate, your associations. And if you don't have one, reach out to COABE because we're making a, a really targeted effort this year to make sure every state has a state association that's strong and that really provides resources to help educators and administrators, business leaders. You know, as I said before, you know, you want to be there when the Amazons and Googles are in the room and uh, reach out to them. Get your local business leaders and your, your national business leaders. Um, you want to get people at the table that are um, ultimately going to benefit from your work. And those, in fact, are the business leaders. Those are the ones that are going to say, you know, I don't have enough talent in my work, my workforce because I don't, they're not educated enough. We don't have the skill set. They don't have enough credentials. 
Um, you want business leaders today at that table with you, emphasizing how important it is for people to know how to operate a computer, how to read, how to write, how to do basic math, so that they can um, they can advance, not only get hired, but they can advance in their companies. Um, you know, judges and courts often bring a really unique perspective to things, but you know, don't leave them out. They're making decisions on sometimes really impactful, um, an impactful way about you know adult education and our justice systems and how they all interplay. Uh, policymakers, you know, all different kinds of policymakers, from commissioners to board members, you know, these are people that should be part of your network that you should be tapping. And then, gosh, I can't say enough about our graduate students and students of adult education. We are, we need to harvest all of that energy that they have when they graduate. And we need to bring them in and we need to show the great work that we're doing through the students that, um, that we work with. So definitely bring those students with you. And they're the ones that often are gonna have the most impact. So making your pitch, just like Shark Tank, you wanna make your pitch short, sweet to the point and effective. And you know, if you ever watch Shark Tank, you know that the ones sometimes that fumble or don't know their facts uh, are often the ones that they go down first, right? <laughs> they, they flounder because you know they don't have their data. They don't know how much their numbers are. You wanna have your facts with you and you wanna make your pitch short and effective. And um, some really great ways of doing that are really looking at um, fact sheets. So if you're not familiar on COABE, the COABE website, there is um, a tab for educate and elevate. And there are unbelievable resources on there that are visual aids. I'm gonna show them to you in a second that you can use that have data fact sheets about all adult education in your state. You wanna be able to use those. Um, in advance of the meeting, you wanna talk about, well, who's gonna do the introduction? Who's gonna lead? Who's gonna give us the story? What's the value proposition? If you're bringing a student with you, spend some time with them, preparing them. You know, help them work through a how to tell their story best. And what are the things that may, may be most impactful? You know, remember that story about the young lady who didn't tell about her dad using the menu. You know, be prepared and help your students be prepared. And then um, do an order, like who's the person telling the story and is it from the district or are, is it local? to the legislator? Is it somebody that they can relate to? Um, back it up with data, obviously, and then have an uh, influential stakeholder there talking with you. You want to keep your meetings to about 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes, and certainly want to allot um, everyone an opportunity. I always start my meetings off with a go-round. Hi, I'm Jeff. We're here today because we need $810 million in additional funding, and I want my team to introduce themselves and go around so everybody knows who they are. And the legislator or legislative aid all often do the same. And then that's how it starts off. And then you run the ball. I mean, you have to have a captain of your ship in there and you wanna make sure your time is used effectively so that you can move somebody on. If they're talking too much, hey, John, you know what? We wanna get the, we want everybody to have a turn here. So let's go on. And you, know, you gotta push the ball forward. 20 minutes is not a long time, trust me. So being prepared. Um, if you're doing these virtually, which is fine, be in a quiet place. Turn your phone off. Make sure the door is closed. You're not going to be interrupted. You know, you want to really dedicate your efforts um, right to what's going on. Just a tip. I learned this the hard way is, um, you know, don't read emails or anything while you're doing these things. Because if you're wearing glasses like I am, sometimes the glasses reflect back into the screen and people can see that you're actually not paying any attention at all to what's going on. Just a little tidbit for you guys out there in, in, um, in Zoomville. So be careful what you're doing. Test your technology. Make sure you can get on. I always get on 15 minutes in advance because sometimes I have some technical problems. I want to make sure I can get on. And then know that time is precious. Um, and that, you know, oftentimes those lifelines, again, are the people, the men and women that are um, the staffers you're working for. Most importantly, don't forget the ask. I always start off with it. I put it in the middle somewhere and I end with it. You know, tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them what you told them, and then tell them, tell them what you told them again. Um, whenever you talk about the meeting, you know, you kind of want to have a nice flow to it. This is kind of a good graphic about it. You know, schedule everyone, reinforce, reinforce why they're there, get the personal story in, talk about the impact, back it up with data, bring your stakeholders in, get the ask done, and then give some time for questions.
Easy peasy, right? It just is a good flow. It's a natural meeting and, um, and, and it's an effective way of, of doing it. Some pro tips, um, introduce everyone. Make sure you do that ask. Leave time for questions at the end. And sometimes, you know, you may get derailed because they may jump in on some questions during the presentation. And that's OK, too. But you want to leave time at the end. Um, you want to make sure that the story is told and that um, and, and really make sure that they understand that it's that that emotional piece of what adult education has done for them and how it's improved their lives, which is often the, the key that everyone's looking for. Um, take notes. You know, you may hear things during that meeting you want to follow up on or a representative may say, hey, can you send me that or I don't have that document anywhere or where'd you get that information? Write it down so you don't forget and take good notes of the meeting so you can relay it back to your association and other people. It's perfectly OK to say, I don't know. If you're asked a question during that meeting, I don't know. And sometimes, honestly, sometimes I say, I don't know when I do know because I want another opportunity to share some more information with them. So sometimes I'll say, you know, I got to check on that, Senator. I'll, I'll get back to you on this. Or um, I'd love to send you this document. I think all of it's included in it. And I'll send it over this afternoon. Um, sometimes it's a great opportunity. So it's okay to say, I don't know. That, that's totally fine. Always send a follow-up. Thank you. Send a follow-up. Attach um, when reattach some, some material so they have it. Give them your contact information, most importantly, so they know how to reach you and ask them if they have any more questions. And then the last set of pro tips are really, you're the expert. Remember, localize your story and, and to personalize it. So advocacy and action are really using all of these things that are out there, TikTok, Facebook, um, podcasts, Instagram. You got it. Press releases, websites. You want to use every tool at, to your advantage. And trust me, many legislators are following them. They'll follow you on Facebook. They'll follow you on Instagram and Twitter. Um, we did a Twitter tweet that reached out to thousands and thousands of people in seconds during our last safe fellowship. So you really want to be, meet, be mindful of all the things that are out there and take advantage of them and really use them um, as often as you can to jump in the pool. Um, this is Advocacy April. Uh, and you want to jump on to COAPE's website and check out uh, Educate and Advocate. It's so easy. With three clicks, you can send in, you can send your platform and your position on adult education or COAPE's position to all your legislators. So really, really simple to do. If you have any challenges at all, reach out to COAPE. We'll be able to support you on it. But these are the tools I'm talking about. This is just one document, that, a fact sheet for Louisiana. Now, this is on every state, so you can pick it up right on our website. We have every state and their fact sheet. We're updating these now as well, but it looks at um, the funding that you got and your performance and how many students you touched and whether they, um, how many got their uh, basic, ed, uh, their, their GED or high school um, equivalency. Um, these are really impactful graphics and, and, and invaluable. Um, whenever you go to a meeting, you should definitely use the, this type of um, of a document uh, because it really spells it out really clear for them. And the numbers are just so persuasive sometimes that that's where the impact often comes. Um, other data sheets that are also by, by state on the COE website for you. Um, this is another one on Pennsylvania. That's adult literacy and numeracy snapshot in Pennsylvania. This is incredible. Um, we looked at the national average was 264 in literacy and Pennsylvania was 266. It was it's great to know. I mean, they want to see that, but we want to know how many are at or below a level three, 44%. Wow. These are the, this is the data that the legislators can really sink their teeth into. Um, again, COABE's website, go onto the Adult um, Educate and Elevate uh, tab and everything is right there for you. And I do encourage you to use it. I would also suggest there's a lot of other resources um, when you do post. Um, these are some of the tags that you can post on. But one of the other sites that I would encourage you to look at is links. Um, I know this is a Department of Education. This is not about advocacy. This is about information gathering. 
And um, I am a moderator for the Correctional and Reentry Education Community of Practice. And I would strongly encourage you to, to check it out and get on there. You can see all the communities that are there from career pathways to teaching and learning, reading and writing, um, you name it, math and numeracy. It's a free platform, but there there's postings all the time of what's going on in the field. And that's something that could be really helpful for you to be prepared and to do your homework. And again, providing you all those, uh, those resources and those tools. So I know we're almost about time, but I did want to give at least a minute or two for anyone that's got any questions. We'll be posting my presentation. So I'll make sure everybody gets all the slides and slide deck so that you can use it and uh, to become better advocates. I will also, I'm going to open the door up now and anyone who wants to throw up a question in the chat box, go ahead. Um, and I will also, there's my contact information. So I want to thank everybody. I want to thank CoWave. Um, thank, thank you, Marie, uh, who, who jumped on. And if, um, if, uh, thank you, Ms. Rivers, who has uh, recently received an award at CoWave. It was great um, speaking with everyone. There's my contact information for, for everybody. I would just want you, number one, um, take the webinar poll that's, um, that's being posted. Reach out to me if you have any questions. It'd be my pleasure to talk with you through any issues that you might have and discuss really what's, you know, what might work for you and how you might be able to do a better job of being an advocate. So again, thank you, CoAbe, and thanks everybody for joining us. And it's Friday. So wishing everyone a happy and safe weekend. And I'll talk to you soon.